by your spirit that we will be taught all things. And by the authority of the blood of your son, we seek that spirit to teach us right now. To magnify thyself, Father. To help us understand exactly what you have designed us to understand. We do not want man's interpretation, man's understanding, but we want from your throne. Lord, there's so much that you've given. We need not think there's something new that we have to learn, but Lord, help us to understand what you've already given, in our, to apply it into our lives, to make it real. That we may be sealed by your Holy Spirit of promise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning's sermon is one that came very interesting in a lot of ways. Last Sabbath, we learned and understood first, Daniel sought God for understanding that he had, of the vision that he had received. He acknowledged the sin of his people and accepted that guilt for himself also, even though he was guiltless. He sought to let the name of God be not held in dishonor or blasphemed. It was during this prayer that Gabriel was sent to give Daniel skill and understanding. And I believe we as individuals need to learn how to study God's Word and the things that God has given us with the same attitude of Daniel. For Daniel accepted the reality that he did not understand Daniel 8.14 yet, but that he was grieving over the condition of his people in Babylon, uh, God's people in Babylon recognizing that because of their comfortableness in Babylon, that they, that they, maybe that the Lord would have to pass them by. Gabriel came and 
instructed to Daniel as we finished last week with the proven fact of the 2300 day prophecy Daniel 8.14 fixed in the autumn of 457 B.C. going to with the decree of recorded and by inspiration of God in Ezra chapter 7 with Daniel's eyes focused on the heavenly sanctuary that was to be cleansed we now have a much better perspective of the importance of the first angel's message in its entirety therefore now let us consider the other prophetic revelations that are designed to bring his people into the knowledge of the most important day on this earth. For this is the reality. That day is the day of atonement of the heavenly sanctuary. The entire plan of redemption for 6,000 years has focused on this day. There are three other time prophecies which have a distinct role in the announcement of this great day of God. Each one of these prophecies are placed within the 2300 day prophecy as waymarks of God's dealing and guidance of humanity as the great day of atonement approaches. Now we are only speaking of the time prophecies that have been revealed. Later, a few weeks from now, we are going to look at the prophetic prophecies in the sanctuary service that also helps us understand that October 22, 1844 is in fact the very beginning of the Day of Atonement and that there is also a close to the Day of Atonement. We will be doing that in a few weeks. Daniel 12, verse 7. We used this in our scripts reading a few moments earlier. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the river, waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever that there shall be a time, times, and a half, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, and all these things shall be finished. Verse 8, And I heard, but I understood what? Yes. not understood not then I said I O Lord O my Lord what shall be the end of these things now there was somebody a few hundred years later that said the same thing to Jesus about uh, talking Peter talking to Jesus he says well what about this same thing Daniel sometimes we ask God for things that we have no business asking about in a kind of way, that's the way the kind of the reaction that God gave to Daniel here in verse 9. He says, and he said, what? Go thy way, for the words are, what? Closed up and sealed until the time of the end. There is much that can be brought out, but instead I would strongly recommend that each one of us individually who hears the sermon, study the writings of Uriah Smith, the original Daniel Revelation of 1897, Elder Haskell's subjects on these of the story of Daniel, the seer of Patmos, thoroughly. These books will give you a solid understanding in a much broader way than what can be done in a sermon. For those of you who have computers, do not use the CD-ROM of 2008. The Ellen White Pioneer disc is flawed greatly. And you need to use the original books themselves as you study this material. Continuing, the angel of the Lord declares to Daniel in verse 10, 
Many shall be what? Purified. Purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do what? Wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Now, the first time I read this, the second time, and the hundredth time I've read this, I overlooked something until this week. I didn't put it in my notes, but I wanted to share it with you. The wise shall understand. Could it be that the wise of the wise virgins who have the oil in their lamps can understand, but the foolish virgins who do not have oil, well, will they be able to understand? Nope. There's a reason why some Seventh-day Adventists understand certain things and there's others that do not. And it's because some have the oil of the Holy Spirit and some do not. Daniel in the Revelation by Uriah Smith, 1897, wrote on the subject of Daniel 12.10, saying, The language doubtless describes a process which is many times repeated in the experience of those who during this time are being made ready for the coming of the kingdom of God. They are purified and made white to a certain degree as compared with their former condition. Then they are again tried. Greater tests are brought to bear upon them. If they endure these, the work of purification is thus carried on and still to a greater extent. Mm -hmm. The process of being made white is made to reach still a what? Highest Higher stage. stage. I remember I was 10 years old. As a child, there's some things, some people never remember anything when they're little, but I was 10 years old and we took a family vacation. It was the last time that we were as a family before my father divorced my mother. Maybe that's the reason why I remember this vacation more vividly. But we were out in California. We went to the gold mines in California, ones that were still active. And as we toured this gold mine, they brought us into this area of these big vats. And I've told the story before. These vats were, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but it was like 24 or 36 feet in diameter, these huge round vats. And each vat was, was heated. And it was very, very hot ore. And they... They heated it up, they heated it up, they heated it up, and all the dross would come to the top, and so they would skim that off the top, and what was left is what they would pour into the next vat, and they would heat it up, and they would heat it up, and heat it up, and the bad stuff would come off the top, and they would skim it off again, and they would go to the third vat. And this process of purification done in that small scale is what is done with our own lives spiritually by God's hand. Amen. And we need not be concerned about trials, but ask the Lord to give us the strength to go through the trials and be willing to have our characters molded to trust Him. Amen. If we are going to be Christians on this earth, we are going to be dealing with struggles and things to purify us that we can be fit vessels to be in heaven. Amen. Amen. You see, we can be anticipating that we think we are going through trials now, but these are just kindergarten things. Sure. These are things, preschool things that we go through now. Sure. When the Sunday law is passed, we're going to be going through college courses. And if we haven't been through the smaller things and been faithful, when we get to the hard stuff, we are going to fail. True. True. Uriah Smith continues, he says, having reached this state, they are tried again, resulting in their being 
still further purified and made white. And thus the process goes until, until characters are developed which can stand the test of the great day. And a spiritual condition is reached which needs what? No further trial. That's where we got to get to. If you're complaining about the trials, if you become depressed over the difficulties of life now, you will not be able to handle when the real troubles come. True. Daniel 12, 11 says, And from the time of the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate is set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. In verse 13. But go thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest. Stand in thy lot at the end of the days. In these verses that we've read, there are four major points of faith that bring us once again to the great day of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary with Jesus Christ, our high priest. The first point, the 1260 days. It's also a time, one year of days, 360, times two years of days, 720, a half time of a half year of days, 180, and the math skills, we can add these up. 360, 720, 180 equals what? 1260, I counted right. Starting in... 538 going to 1798. This we know is a fact. For beginning with the fall of Rome, the Eastern Roman Empire, we need to understand a lot of times we overlook this very important fact. When we talk about the fall of Rome, we're not talking about the entire Roman Empire. We're only talking about the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The fall of the Western Roman Empire when it was transpiring prior to 508. There were three nationalities, three nations of people who were in opposition to papal authority which had to be removed out of the way so that with their destruction, the Emperor Justinian, Justinian from, the Western, from the Eastern Empire of Rome came to the Western capital and appointed Vigilus as Pope. Gave all of the civil authority to the Roman Catholic Pope, who was really a pagan, gave all of that information and knowledge of power to the west of the western roman empire to the church making it the papacy take close note the papal rule never ruled any portion of the eastern part of the roman empire the papal rule never had any authority in the Eastern Roman Empire. Therefore, the, Pope, the papal church power in any form cannot be for any reason the king of the north. For the Eastern Roman Empire was still existing even during the 1260 year prophecy. 
We will get into at one point sometime here the, the three woes. Those three woes are directly related to the first two especially with Eastern Roman Empire. Third point. The 13, thir 12, Seven. the 13, oh, we already went, we, did we already do the 1290? No. Yes. Oh, I skipped two pages here, I'm sorry. During the 1260, the papal rule of the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages really only covered where Catholicism ruled. The Eastern Roman Empire was influenced more by the Muslim at this time. Now there's an interesting fact here. The universities that were controlled by the papal system prior to 1798 all taught that the world was flat. But guess what? <coughs> All of the universities throughout the rule of the Ottoman Empire and the Greek Orthodox Church, both, their universities held that the earth was round and sphere in shape. Interesting, huh? The 1290, as we are going to now, with the fall of Rome, the, the Western Empire, that 30-year period, right here, from 508 to 538, this is the area in which the three nationalities were either utterly destroyed or completely removed out of Rome and was being brought into extinction in 538 when Vigilus the pagan was made Pope for the western part of Rome. Let's go on to the 1335. The 1335, Daniel 12, 12. It says, Blessed is he that waiteth until the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. God is pronouncing a blessing on those who waited and trusted his guiding hand. Amen. This must grasp our minds for a direct importance for us today. Who must wait for our redeemer, redeemer high priest, and king, Jesus Christ. With these hundred and thirteen hundred and 35 days of time prophecy is a prophetic prophecy that brings us in direct view of the opening of the most holy place in heaven and the day of atonement beginning. Truly every believer in the work of Jesus in our behalf in heaven will be blessed as we enter in by faith. Amen. Amen. But now Daniel was told something. Point number four. Verse 13, it says, But thou, Daniel, go thy way till the end be. And then the Lord says through the angel, For thou shalt what? Rest. Rest. What does it mean when Daniel is told you're going to rest? Did Daniel know what he said? What that? What the angel meant? I think so. Yeah, yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah, he's not going to live to see. He's not going to live to see all this going on. Right. Daniel, you're going to go to sleep. Yeah. Work is done. 
You are going to die. Then the angel says, and stand in thy lot at the end of days. In other words, you are going to stay dead, and at the end of all things, that's when you are going to be brought before the judgment. Wow. You're not going to heaven now. When you die, you're not going to go to heaven. You're going to wait, and you're going to stand in the judgment at the end of days. There's a lot here. But let us understand. Gabriel is clear. He's telling Daniel, you will die, you will sleep and rest, waiting for the time to come when God's judgment will be happening. Daniel does not come face to face in this judgment. Right. But rather his record of life recorded in heaven will be brought before his father and our father. Yes. To stand in one's lot. The very judgment of God spoken of here is the very first angel's message. Amen. This first angel does not conclude therefore yet with the fact that judgment of God is come. We have just recognized and acknowledged that the beginning of the judgment was from 1844. Yeah. <clears throat> but the first angel's message does not end with the judgment. Let us read Revelation 14, 7. The last half says, Worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and fountains of waters. Worship him. The hour of judgment has come and worship yeah. him. Yeah. We must be of the mind that we are coming before him as he asks us to come before him. It is a dangerous thing for any human being to presumptuously come into a house of worship and then pursue and presume to worship God who made heaven and earth see in everything that we have the right to tell God exactly how we are going to worship when? and the when we're going to worship mm -hmm. we should be asking Lord how do you want us to come Amen. you see is it not just like Cain yes when we say, Lord, we're going to come and worship you, we're going to bring our drums and we're going to bring our dancing. We're going to bring all the things that we want to do because we are going to get in the spirit and we're going to worship God. <laughs> yes. But did God say on the Day of Atonement to do that? No, he did not. He said that it's going to be a holy convocation which is to be of deep soul searching. Not of some party going on. Yeah. Therefore, let us look at the 1828 dictionary for the word worship. To adore. To pay divine honors to. To reverence with supreme respect and veneration. To honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. When you are telling God how you are going to come into his house, you are not submitting to his authority. You're demanding God to submit to your authority. Mm. How we manage the money that God has given to us is part of worship. When God says 10% of your income that I have given you the ability to, to, to gain is returned in tithe, we don't say, well, this week we'll give 10%. Next week we'll give 3 because we, don't, we can't afford to give 10. Yeah. No, God said give 10. Then he says, of the 90 left, bring an offering. So you have... 
10 plus an offering. The children of Israel were blessed the most when they gave up to 30% of their income into the sanctuary service. We complain when we give 10%. It is here with this verse that we just read. The first angel's message as it was given prior to 1844 and today has some significance. Because right here, Christianity as a whole has failed to acknowledge God as our creator. Every one of the professed denominations prior to 1844 who rejected the first call of the first angel's message Every single one of them after 1844 began to accept some variation of evolution instead of the Bible fact of creation. True. You see, they had to. Because they were bowing to the spirit that wasn't of God. The rejection of the first angel's message came a withdrawal of God's Spirit. And if there are those today who have listened to the messages that we have been giving on the first angel's message, and they say, that's not, we can't accept that, you are in danger of having the Holy Spirit withdrawn from you, and then Satan will inspire the doctrines and not God. No matter what is taught afterwards, it's not God. For ever since the Baptist, the Methodist, the Episcopalian, the Nazarene, the Presbyterians, as they rejected the first call of the 1840s up to 1844 with the message that Jesus was coming soon by the Miller right movement. When they rejected the messages that were given in that day, they fell. And Satan began to bring in their doctrines of demonic inspiration masking it as Christianity. I'll give you some examples. Prior to 1844, did you know that no Christian professed church of any denomination ever accepted the wedding ban as a sign of marriage? Prior to 1844. Not one. But every denomination that rejected the first angel's message quickly after 1844 accepted the wedding ban as a sign of marriage. They quickly accepted some version of, of evolution instead of Bible creation after 1844. This kind of thing will be happening and repeating time and time again and has repeated and will be kept repeating to this very day. You see, no matter how high any earthly organization of profession can get, no matter how high you as an individual can be in your profession, when there is a rejection of God's present truth, God begins to withdraw. God will very soon withdraw his spirit from the midst of those who are rejecting God's present truth. Amen. True. With the questioning of the origin of this earth and life on it, diverting one's attention away from the holy word of God as a sole authority of creation and the beginning of life brings a natural rejection to God's law and the seal of the fourth commandment. 
modern scientists, even as very recent as a few years ago, acknowledge publicly that if they would accept creation as stated in the Bible, as the authority of the seven-day week cycle, the seventh day Sabbath would have to be also accepted. And because they refused to accept the seventh day Sabbath and the seven day week cycle as designed by God in creation, they pervert the historical facts and try to pervert things to make it prove scientifically that we came from monkeys and not from the hand of God. Even in Adventist hospitals today, this perverted attitude is even in there. For when you take organs of animals and put them into humans, yes, it's exactly what they're doing. In the name of medical science, it is not after God's order. To worship means to adore, to honor. To do this before our Heavenly Father, we must first adore and honor Him in the manner in which He brings Himself as He has defined, which brings honor and adoration. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith. It's what? Impossible to, impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It doesn't say that seek him, it says that diligently seek him. In other words, just coming to church on Sabbath is not diligently seeking your heavenly father. Just opening up your Bible and reading a verse and saying, okay, I've studied my Bible today. I can go out and do whatever I want. That's not diligently seeking Him. <clears throat> to diligently seek our Heavenly Father means to have on your mind every moment of the day that you are your Father's son or your Father's daughter. <clears throat> this is no ordinary faith. It is the faith in which was given to each one of us. Romans 12:3. For I say, through grace, the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Well, right there, we all could take a lesson from that. So many times we get a little bit of education and we think we're somebody when we're really nobody. There are many individuals who think because they have a master's degree or have a doctorate degree, now they're the authority and they got to be listened to. But the Bible says, to every man that is among you and every woman, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to how many? Every man, every woman, the measure of faith, not a measure of faith, the measure of faith. That measure of faith is the ver is in verity the faith of Jesus brought into humanity, which is the very enmity against sin and wickedness, which is the sin nature inherited by birth. Without this measure of faith, humanity would have long been destroyed itself in complete evil and wickedness in every aspect of life. In Jesus, we have a way of escape. It is in leaning on and to bring, to bring this faith of Jesus, God's Son, that we may please our Heavenly Father. Amen. For then, when we acknowledge our helplessness, our hopelessness without this faith, given by God's grace unto us that we might live and give honor to his name. And like David, let us in our daily time, daily time in prayer, 
just moment by moment, minute by minute, declare as he did in Psalm 79, 9, help us, O God, of our salvation. For the glory of thy name, deliver us, purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Not for my name's sake, for thy name's sake. Amen. Solve the issues that I'm dealing with, Lord, not for me, my sake, but that your name may be glorified. Amen. With this help from our Heavenly Father, we may practice in reality the admonition of Paul and be inspired to write, whether therefore we eat or drink, or whatever we do, do what? All to the glory of God. In other words, whenever you're doing something and you do it well, do not take adoration for what you have done well. Yeah. Give it glory to God. Because He's the one that gave you the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. In everything in our lives, it should be done to bring honor and glory to our Heavenly Father. To reverence our Heavenly Father as we do everything, we can only do it mm -hmm. by faith. Yeah. We have entered in with our high priest. It's the most holy place of heaven by faith. That our sins will be more than just covered <coughs> by the blood of Christ. But by the authority of the blood of Christ, they can be also removed blotted out. Be removed from me to be removed from you. Placed on the originator of all sin, Satan, that serpent, the devil, the father of lies and the father of all sin. Mm -hmm. To worship God, we will always acknowledge by our daily life and practice that we are not our own, but we are bought by the blood of Christ. Therefore, if we truly practice by faith that we are not our own, but we are bought by Jesus, we will never say a word or do anything that we would, we are directed, but that we are directed by the Spirit of God, by the authority of Jesus Christ. For He will direct our feet to walk by the Spirit and not by our flesh, Amen. as we are surrendered to Him and to His authority. Amen. It is then and only then. It is then and only then that we be living in cooperation by faith in the first angel's message. Let us never forget this principle of life by faith. The servant of the Lord, Ellen White, messenger and prophet of God. Christian education, written in 1894, page 122 says this, unless the human agent shall bring his will into harmony with what? The will, the will of God. Unless he shall forsake every idol and overcome every wrong practice, he will never succeed in the warfare, but will be finally what? Overcome. Overcome. Now there's a few points in here. There's absolutes everywhere unless the human agent in other words we've got us we've got a surrendering work that needs to be done Amen. to bring into harmony with God's will means that we must first know what God's will is unless we forsake every idol but do we know what an idol is you see sometimes we make an idol of our family members or of our abilities or of where we live and where we would like to live or what we would like to have and what we would, you know, there's a lot of idols. There's people who make idols of ministers, mm -hmm. idols of celebrities, idols of athletes, idols of things to overcome every wrong practice, but less, Lord, do we, even have, do we even have that conversation with our Heavenly Father of telling us what a wrong practice is? Mm. As we now close the first angel's message, 
not because we've exhausted its understanding, but because we have gained the foundation to go on further now onto our study. For oneself to study by the power of the Holy Spirit to help you to assimilate it into your own life. In review, God brings his first message to a lost world by heaven's authority. God's messenger has in possession the everlasting gospel, the good news unto salvation, which the everlasting covenant made by the Godhead to design and make possible the plan of redemption. Amen. <laughs> because of their foreknowledge of the fall of humanity into sin and rebellion against their creator. Again, the prophet of God in Australasian Union Conference record, April 1, 1901. I've read this a few times and we're going to make sure that we keep saying it. This is an original writing. It's not doctored. The Godhead was stirred with the pity for the race. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working of the plan of redemption. In order to fully carry out this plan, it was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself for an offering for sin. saying with power so that all could hear and understand that all could intelligently make a choice for themselves to accept or reject God's offer of salvation saying God's judgment is come Amen. to be living in the very time of God's judgment must be acknowledged as the most solemn time of world's history ever before Acts 17, 30 and 31 declares, at the times of, God, of this ignorance, God winked. But now commandeth how many? All, all men, all women, everywhere to repent. Now, everywhere means everywhere, not somewhere. The whole world is involved. God has winked at the ignorance of humanity in their past profession in times past, but now God has opened the very doors of heaven, the holiest of all. Now judgment is revealed. Amen. All things of God's required is revealed. For verse 31 declares, because he God hath appointed a day, <coughs> in which he will judge the world in righteousness, in righteousness that by man by he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance to all men in that he raised him from the dead. This day is appointed the heavenly sanctuary in the day of atonement. This day began October 22, 1844, with Jesus following his Father into the most holy place to begin the day of atonement, to begin the day of judgment, beginning first with the dead and then with the living. Deciding who has more than just a profession to be God's people. But who has in their lives no longer been satisfied with the profession, but has wanted God to have this transforming power, the renewing power of our minds to be controlled. <clears throat> even those that have died prior to even Jesus coming the first time, lived by faith that their characters would be transformed. Abraham looked for a city that was not a builder of man, but a builder by God. Amen. Moses looked for that also. Every one of the patriarchs looked for the land and has not inherited it yet because it has not been done and created yet. 
Even Enoch, who walked with God, was translated into heaven. He has not inherited the land yet. He goes from planet to planet throughout the universe, but yet he does not inherit because it cannot be inherited until God has created it. And God will never create our inheritance until he's destroyed all sin. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> But there has to be investigation of who of God's people has had their minds renewed in him. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good acceptable, perfect will of God. Amen. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is what? Corrupt, Corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Amen. And that ye put on the new man. After the new man, which after God created in righteousness and true holiness. This only can be a reality in our lives by Philippians 2, 5 being a reality. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To have this mind, we must never think we are anything but dirty dirt mm -hmm. under the very condemnation of God. But having Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. For this is the everlasting gospel offered by the Godhead of the universe. For if anyone declares, hereby know ye that the Spirit of God every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is of God. Amen. Amen. And every spirit that confesses not that Christ come in the flesh is not of God. Mm -hmm. And is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard it shall come and even now is already in the world. Now just stop right there. There's a lot of people that talk about the papacy being the Antichrist. The papacy didn't begin until when? 538. Now John wrote this around 96 AD. John said the spirit of Antichrist had already come into the world. So there is an Antichrist that is not the papacy. It is every human being that declares that Christ cannot come in and live in you. The hope of glory. The hope of glory. Amen. John continues and he writes, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because, because greater is he that is within you, you, you than he that is in, in the world. world. Amen. 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 Alonzo T. Jones in Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, August 2, 1892, wrote this. It is the revelation of Jesus himself as he was revealed in Paul and as he is revealed in men, the hope of glory. Amen. And this is how Paul received the gospel by revelation of Jesus Christ, not only, in, not only to him, but in him. Amen. 
This is enough to show that the gospel is the mystery of God. Yes. That the preaching of the gospel is the preaching of the mystery of God. And the preaching of the mystery of God is the preaching of Christ in man. Amen. Amen. This is the revelation of the mystery of God. This is the gospel that the apostles preached and is the only true gospel. Amen. Amen. <coughs> only that we are daily yes. pleading that we have this everlasting gospel in us for the very hope of glory for Ephesians 1 says this in whom ye have also trusted after you have heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after ye have believed Ye were what? Sealed. Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest, which is the down payment of our inheritance until redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. The plan of redemption is laid before us. From beginning to end of all things, of all heaven is involved in our redemption for the glory of God our Father and His Son Jesus Christ Amen. let us never lessen the work that is to be done in our lives daily moment by moment for the glory of our Father and the honor of His Son Amen Amen, Amen. 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 <clears throat> God says, you're going to stand in your lot. The judgment of God is now. And you will stand in your lot. In your spouse's lot, not in your mother's or your father's lot, in thy lot. How will you stand? How are you standing today? For judgment of God is going on now. Let us be mindful every step we take that we are now as we profess to be God's people that we are living in the judgment of God Amen. how do we stand let us kneel before his presence Amen. Of a merciful and gracious Father. At this time, whether it be here in this house of worship, online or listening on DVD, Lord, may each one come before thee and say, Lord, how do I stand? Not how my profession is, but how do I really stand before thee? For though there is only one probation closing at the end of the day of atonement, probation can close individually at any time. How do we stand, Lord? Are we living for self or are we living for thee, Lord? Are we living for the glory of you, Father, for the honor of thy Son, or do we live for the honor of ourself? Are we serving self or are we serving thee, Lord? Tell us and teach us. By your Spirit, help us to understand, for you have promised that by your Spirit you will purge all things that are of evil, that you will teach us all things that are right that you will bring the life and faith of your Son within us by your Spirit. Fill us, Lord. The power of the latter rain can come only as we are pure. But, Lord, not in our own eyes, but in thine we pray. That we may be used of thee, used up for thee, Totally and completely, we pray. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.